This is Isaac Kotick at ClassTrack.org, and this is another video in our series of Meet the Educators. In this video, we're going to be talking to Katie at Midnight Music, who has done some amazing stuff with training teachers on music education and music technology and how to implement it in their classroom. So without ado, let's talk to Katie at Midnight Music. Great. Well, um, thanks for spending the time. I've been reading your blog and checking out your site for a while. I really enjoy it. I uh, love the information that you share on there. So I just wanted to ask some questions about. Thank you. Um, it's very nice. <laughs> yeah, about you, what you're doing, um, just the state of education in general, and and also take an opportunity to to just show off your site to other teachers. So. Yeah. Sure. No problem. Shoot, go for it. <laughs> cool. <laughs> uh, well, I just started recording, and okay, I'm just cool. like recording the screen and the audio, and then I'll probably yeah. edit it or something later. But yeah, sure. Um, right. Well, I guess the first thing is just an introduction on yourself of like who you are, your experience with teaching, and um, how I found you was midnightmusic.com.au. Just a little uh, description of what you're what you're up to. Um, yeah, no, well, I, I sort of, I started the business up, uh, a while ago. Um, I don't know, it's been a number of years, actually. I wasn't doing it on its own. It wasn't my only thing for a long time. I was, um, you know, working kind of what I call normal jobs, <laughs> working for other people and, um, always been involved with education, but, but I've never actually been sort of a full-time teacher in the classroom at any stage. And, I've just stayed uh, involved with education and, and music stuff specifically. So I, I sort of did some work in, you know, retail, music retail uh, shop here in Australia. And and then I, I moved on to doing some arts administration work with, <clears throat> um, the. we have an orchestra here in Victoria that plays for the opera and the ballet. So I was working for them for quite some time. That was really great. And ended up, uh, I was doing copying and arranging a lot. So that, that's where the midnight music name came from in the first place mm. because all of that work is basically after hours and um you know when you when people ring up for that sort of work my first question is what's your deadline and they nearly always say last week <laughs> and so you, you're kind of working you know long hours to get that that work done at the last minute to to meet some sort of deadline so so that was where the name came from I thought you know I'm always working at midnight it's just crazy and and that's what I ended up with but um but then I, I worked for Sibelius for some time, so I got a, a job there through a friend of mine, James, and that was my introduction into technology, really. And before then, I had really used, you know, hardly any technology at all. I mean, just bits and pieces of, you know, Microsoft Word, and Sibelius was the only music program I was really using at the time, and um, I didn't really grow up with technology being a huge part of my life. I grew up at that time where, you know, there wasn't internet and um, showing my age now, but <laughs> there wasn't internet and there was, you know, very little going on at school and even at uni. I, I typed all of my university essays on a typewriter, you know, that was the, the whiz-bang technology at that stage and some people were using computers, but it wasn't a big thing really at all. There was still a lot of handwriting of, of assignments going on. So, yeah, so Sibelius was a great um, introduction into sort of technology generally, but using that, that software and I really loved working there. I got thrown in the deep end a little bit because we had to do some tech support as part of our role <laughs> and that was mm. hilarious, but um, such a great, great way to learn all sorts of things about operating systems and, you know, the differences between Mac and PC and um, just the whole process with software, you know, beta testing and um, that, that sort of timeline that people work to and that was really, really great sort of learning all of that stuff and um, a big part of my job there was to work with teachers and because it was an education-related role. So I was mm -hmm. presenting at conferences and doing some training sessions and that sort of thing and when my job ended there, I thought, well, that was the bit that I really liked doing. I really liked helping people and um, explaining things in a way that they could understand. So I decided to sort of keep it going but just on my own and, and try to add in other software programs and, and other aspects to it too. And it, it seemed to work, which was a good thing. <laughs> so that was about uh, six years ago, nearly seven years ago now. 
And I did a lot of Sibelius training in the early days and, um, you know, Sibelius, you know, the company had other software programs as part of, you know, what they were doing. So I did sort of a Railier and Musician and O Generator and Groovy Music at the time. And um, so I had a, a bit of a variety, but then I, I did a steep learning curve and, and taught myself a lot of other stuff because people were asking for things like garage band workshops and Acid Music Studio and, and so I threw myself in the deep end and booked in workshops not really knowing the software and had to, to do a crash course <laughs> in mm-hmm. order to learn it in time. But that was good. That was the best way to learn again, you know, just having the pressure of a deadline is always a really good thing. Yeah. And, yeah, and it was for helping teachers. I, I found, you know, um, I, I have done over the years um, some student workshops, which I love doing because I, I get to sort of see that things are working the way that I think that they will work. You know, I'm often suggesting to teachers lesson plan ideas or, you know, activities um, in lessons and uh, I don't often get a chance to test them out on students. So I, I just sort of say, yeah, I'm, I'm sure this will work really well. <laughs> and mm-hmm. um, sometimes it's nice to actually go and run a student workshop. But I, I really think the better thing is for me to train the teachers so that they can continue after I go for that day, you know, continue on, um, you know, doing the stuff rather than me come in and work with students for a day and then go away again. Uh, I, I like the idea of training the teachers so that it's a, a lasting effect in the school and in what they're doing and, um, yeah, helping them sort of get comfortable with it. I think that's the biggest thing. Yeah. So, yeah, that, that's, the, that's sort of the way that I got into it all and um, it, it's just kind of grown from there really. Yeah, I think, I think it's been really great. So how long has midnightmusic.com.au been around? I, I think I first saw it like a year ago. I don't quite know yeah. how I came across it, but um, I've definitely seen it evolve since then, and I'm just wondering how. Yeah. Um, the website I, I started, um, how long ago would it have been? I think it was probably 2009. For me, that was a year. For some reason, that was a year of uh, launching myself into social media and the online world. I kind of I discovered Twitter that year, and... I remember seeing an article, it was an article in a newspaper, I think, like an actual printed newspaper at the time about Twitter and how, you know, how it was growing so much. And I remember they mentioned, um, you know, Stephen Fry and how many followers he had because he had a huge amount of followers then and it's probably Mm. doubled or tripled since then. But, you know, he had, I I don't know, however many million followers or hundreds of thousands of followers at that time. And, And I thought, I don't even know what this Twitter thing is, you know, and I kind of jumped on there and, um, you know, discovered the sort of the business side of using Facebook and, and I, I wanted to have a website and I thought I needed a website really just as an online brochure. That was, that was the main aim at mm. first was just to have a place to advertise the business and then later down the track and the first one I put together was um, using iWeb on the Mac and <laughs> did it all myself, you know, and I was thinking, oh, I just didn't want it to look too homemade. Um, and it, it was okay. It was fine. Lots of people said it looked great, but you know, I was thinking, oh, I don't know. This will do for now. And then I separately started in a completely separate place. Started a blog um, because I wanted a place that was online to put uh, things that I was sharing in workshops, which come up all the time. You know, I thought, well, it's it's silly to, for me to have notes that I send out to people. I may as well put it online somewhere so they can all access it in a central location and. And so that, that was the reason for starting a blog initially. And then eventually I thought, I really need these two things to be in the one place. So I mm-hmm. ended up combining them. And, and I, the blog I had started on WordPress, um, you know, wordpress.org and, hang on, is that the right way around? .com.org. Anyway, whichever the free one is, that was the one I started with. And then I eventually switched my whole website over to a WordPress site, you know, self-hosted WordPress site. And that was a much, much better option. And Mm -hmm. the blog in the same place and that that sort of helped lead people to the business through the blog anyway. And um, and I sort of realized the power of blogging and and how good that can be for just generating interest in in your business, but also helping people out at the same time. So it was a win-win for everybody, (laughs) I Mm -hmm. think. (laughs) Yeah. So yeah, I think 2009 was probably the first first year. And it's been through a couple of different versions since then, maybe three or four versions now. Yeah. And just yeah, just did a bit of a refresh um, earlier this year, which was really good, and it will continue to refresh, I'm sure, over time. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, it has a way of doing that. 
Yeah. Um, <laughs> it's never finished, is it? <laughs> yeah. So that, that perfectly leads into the next question, which was, because um, I've read your blog and you have lots of articles on there around music industry, music teaching, a lot of technology that's being used in classrooms. And over the last uh, few years with with you doing this type of work, I'm wondering what type of changes you've seen in the music classroom, like specifically what is changing around how teachers approach their students and what they're they're trying to teach through technology? Mm, I think the the biggest shift I've seen over time when I, when I first started, um, I think for me the the sort of the feeling from teachers was uh, a lot of people were afraid of technology or didn't like it and. I think there was a feeling that it would go away. And so, you know, there was a lot of, yeah, but I don't want to do that anyway, so I, I won't worry about it. But then things started shifting. I noticed that more and more teachers were coming to workshops that I was running sort of in person and saying, look, you know, I, I need to learn the technology. My principal is telling me I, I have to incorporate. And then, you know, they, they have sort of um, goals that they might need to meet each year or, or new skills that they need to learn as a teacher. Um, they definitely do that in Australia anyway. They sort of have, you know, goals that they, they write down and, and need to meet for the year. And a lot of people were telling me my goals this year are to include more technology or in specific ways and um, because I'm being told to, you know, that, that was the main thing. And so I think at first there was a bit of, well, quite a lot of resistance to technology, even though people were coming to workshops. But over time, that's really shifted, I think. And nowadays, I think people know that it's um, it's either it's going to do a few things. It can either save them time or it can make an activity different. I, I hesitate to say more engaging because I think music can be engaging completely without any technology. But you know, it can be engaging in a different way and it might appeal to certain students in the class as opposed to, to other ones that will be happy with whatever you do. Um, and then, then there are lots of activities you can do which you can't do without the technology. So, um, and I think, I think over time teachers have become much more open to that. There's still a fear of, of using it definitely amongst most of the teachers that I train and just not enough time to learn. So I think for me that's been the biggest kind of change over time is all about, you know, the teachers and their motivation really. And I think it's, I think it's changing a lot now. I, I recently did about a month ago maybe um, a keynote speech at two different conferences. I did the same, the same one and my whole theme of that was uh, level up. So it was all about... Just, you know, no matter where you are on your tech journey is to just, you know, take the next step. And that might be, for someone, that might be just a really tiny step like, I don't know, maybe creating resources in PowerPoint as opposed to on paper, you know, printed worksheets or, or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but, you know, to do more adventurous things if you can. And um, it was great to show some examples of, of how teachers are using technology and to inspire people and I think, yeah, it seemed to go down well. So I'm hoping that, that some people will do that and just take on a couple of things and move on a little bit further from where they are. Mm -hmm. Did that answer the question? I've forgotten the original question now. <laughs> uh, yeah, just the changing yeah. of um, music classroom. Maybe. It sounds like... Uh... Yeah, and I think, I mean, also the, the change of um, the availability of, you know, uh, devices for individual students as changed a lot over time. I mean, it's much more normal now to have, I don't know, some kind of access to devices that students can actually use, whether it's laptops or, or iPads or, or whatever. But I mean, it, when I first started, there were, it was most, most teachers had their own laptop, but not everybody. And now that's pretty normal. I mean, everybody has their own laptop as a teacher now. Um, and then it would only be some schools that would have a computer lab where they could access computers and, and take students in there for a music class and that might be timetabled you know with lots of other subjects as, as well and and it was very rare to have you know the music department had their own computer lab that was kind of like wow you know really great and then over time I think that's really shifted now um, people are moving very much away from the, the computer lab model and it's all sort of one-to-one -one devices so it's much more normal to have some kind of device, maybe not through, you know, the whole of the, the school year levels, but, you know, there's iPad class sets or students have to bring their own iPads or other tablet devices or laptops now. So I think that the technology is a bit more available from a, on a, a daily basis, which mm -hmm. is a great thing. 
Yeah. Yeah, I can see that uh, immensely so, especially with the laptop and stuff where it's like before there was a lot more buying of books and buying of material and now it's more like buy, yeah. buy a device. <laughs> yeah, which I think is great because um, the computer lab model, it, it means that things are, that the, the technology has to be its own special lesson and, you know, my philosophy is that the technology, you always want it to be just a normal part of your everyday you know, one one aspect of what you're teaching. And so, you know, ideally you would be in a music classroom where you, you do some singing and some playing around a specific topic or, or subject or whatever and then you move on to the iPads or the laptops to do a follow-up activity or to do a creative project based around that thing and then you might move back to more singing and composition or, or whatever it is and it, it should hopefully all be you know as part of a a broader activity whereas Mm -hmm. the computer lab model you sort of had to do it as a special standalone thing it used to be a lot more you know we're going to have a music technology class today (laughs) as a separate thing and I'm I'm glad things are moving a little bit away from that it's a a good thing yeah um well that kind of leads in a way to my next question of uh You've, you've taught lots of different teachers at conferences and different places, and you have an online presence and so on. And I'm wondering what successful stories you have around either uh, a student that have taken your class or teachers that have come back to you saying, oh, this is how I implemented this in my classroom, yeah. and this is how it affected my students. Yeah. Luckily, I'm, I'm really happy to say I get lots of people writing to me to tell me, which I always think is so lovely because often you might think about things that have helped you but for people to actually take the time to write is um i'm really touched when people do that so yeah there's been quite a few and it's um it's all teachers really i, I don't have any direct contact with any students that I've, I've done workshops with and they've been a lot you know less frequent anyway but um but yeah the teachers i mean for me a lot of the time the 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 compliment that I get is that I explain things in a way that they can understand and, it, you know, it, it breaks it down to step by step. So it means that they actually have a go at something. But um, lots of people have come back from, say, the, the iPad projects uh, collection that I have and, uh, you know, I sell sort of a collection of projects where it's step by step activities that you can use uh, with students and there's videos that go along with them. So, so teachers have written back and said that, you know, Finally, they've broken through to the year eight boy class that they've had trouble with all year. Mm. You know, I've had a couple of those comments, which has been really great, and and that the kids were engaged for the whole lesson, whereas they've had they've had trouble with that in the past. And um, just by doing these sort of simple things that that appeal to the kids, so that's been really good. But even just to um, get the feedback that even just everyday life that you know teachers are maybe taking on things, you know, by using their laptop a little bit more than they were, um, not even necessarily through music stuff, but just in their everyday life, but, but feeling less afraid of that and um, trying things out with students. And, you know, my warning is always with people that you always need that contingency plan because I think so many people think, oh, technology, something will always go wrong. And, I think, well, yeah, it does a lot of the time, but but things can go wrong when you're doing ukulele lessons as well or, you know, whatever it is, strings can break or things are out of tune, but, you know, you, you just need to have a contingency and some some plan to get around it, mm. I think, at, at the same time. But, but yes, um, yeah, lots of lots of nice feedback about people that have done, done workshops. I'm, I'm struggling to think of a very specific example, but yeah, but yeah there are lots of nice ones, which is good. <laughs> Great. Um, the next thing is... I know because I've been working with more teachers and administrators and it gets pretty complicated in terms of the hierarchy of, of what's happening within school systems. And I'm wondering um, what, if you've worked with administrators and teachers, or is it mainly just teachers and what might be the difference? um, Yeah, mostly being teachers, but sometimes occasionally I do get contact with, you know, sort of higher up the, the food chain, so to speak. Um, and I'm often, I often find myself talking to the IT person at the school because, you know, the teacher might not under, have an understanding of how things need to work from, you know, for the network at the school or, or whatever mm. it is. And um, so I'm often, you know, talking to them. But, 
but the hierarchy, I mean, there are some, you know, sort of principals or vice principals who, who want the technology implemented and, um, and want to support the teachers in doing that as well. And so that, that can be good. Sometimes I'm, I'm talking to them and often when I go and run a workshop actually in a school, you know, I, I do get sometimes introduced to the principal or, or person, you know, and they'll, they'll maybe even come and visit some of our session, which can be a good thing. My computer's mm-hmm. just gone to sleep. I'm hoping it's still there. Yes, it could. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah and uh, yeah, that, that can be quite useful. But yeah, but frequently the, I, the IT person um, comes in and has a chat because, you know, we, we talk about the best way things can work. Sometimes the IT person knows a lot. They obviously know a lot about the technical side of things, but they don't often know from a music point of view. And there are occasional differences, you know, between what is right for the music teacher and what might be right for the rest of the teachers at the school because of, you know, the way we have to deal with audio and video and, mm-hmm. and all those sorts of things. So, um, you know, one, one silly example is displaying the iPad on a data projector. Um, you know, I'm constantly telling teachers you're much better off plugging into the VGA cable or the HDMI cable like with the adapter into your iPad and not using Apple TV or one of those wireless options because there's such latency involved with those those wireless options and and you know the teachers often get told yeah but we, we've got Apple TV in every classroom and we just need to use that the IT person says it works great you know I'm like yeah but they don't have to play in time to a metronome mm. in garage band using the drum kit you know go and tell them to try that and they're going to have problems so so yeah, so there's a few differences like that, and um, and the, the IT people are good because I, I speak, I can speak their language adequately enough that that you know I can explain why to them it, it's not such a good thing for the music teacher. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, yeah, I think it is good talking to the the hierarchy a little bit, um, just to yeah to sort of show them the importance of it. But but I do find they're they're pretty supportive. I think in the first place, and there's probably a bit more resistance from the the music teachers who are a bit more worried about how to implement the technology hmm. than the other way around. So yeah. Hmm. Um, and then I think for the last question, uh, what are your thoughts around why music technology? Why teach these in schools and teach? more of a technological approach to music as compared to just developing and working on the the norm of the orchestra. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, and it, I mean, things are quite different for us over here in Australia. You know, our, our system, we don't have the, the band choir orchestra strong program that's in the States. You know, that's not the focus for us here at all. All of those things are extracurricular activities and they're not the main part of our music program. Mm-hmm. So, so it's quite different over here. We, we have general music is our main thing and, you know, all the ensembles are, are on the periphery, which is not, not always a good thing. That, I mean, the music teachers here would love them to be timetabled, but that's, that's just not the way it happens here. And I think it's a bit closer to the way it is in the UK. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I think... I think the the technology for you know the kids that don't play instruments as such is is such a fabulous thing for them to be able to say put together a whole track you know a, rec- a, tra- a re- multi-track recording of all these instruments that they don't necessarily play I mean it's so accessible when you do that through through apps or software you know you've got everything there at your fingertips and I can put down a great you know guitar line and I'm not a guitarist at all I can I can just use what's at my you know my disposal in in terms of software programs and it it's fabulous to be able to do that but um but yeah that that's a great a great thing for me that's why I think technology is so appealing is that you've got that access accessibility to to sort of create things that you wouldn't be able to create unless you could play a whole massive range of instruments and Mm -hmm. um yeah hopefully hopefully students do get access to that and I find that's the thing they're often doing, you know, people laugh, but I always say, you know, what's the thing that the, the teenagers are going to be doing in their bedroom at home when they're, you know, after school? And it's, it's often things like listening to their favourite songs on Spotify or whatever and, and wanting to create that type of music themselves and, and maybe their own versions of it or, or even covers or, you know, video recordings and a cappella versions and, and all of that sort of stuff. And if you can bring mm-hmm. that into the classroom in some kind of way, then I think that's really appealing for that group. And, yeah, mostly it's because of technology that that, that can happen. Yeah. 
Yeah. Great. Well, uh, thanks so much for talking about all the things that you've gone through at Midnight Music and okay. music education, your history. There, there were lots of good stuff in there. And um, do you want to say any last words about uh, your site or, or anything that you have going on um, coming up? Um, com- well, coming up, actually, I've got a few changes happening uh, in the hopefully in the near future. I'm crossing my fingers. I haven't got a specific timeline yet, but but I'm hoping to start a um, basically an online community for music teachers because I get so many emails asking questions all the time. I think it's going to be much better for me to have a central place where everybody can ask the questions and I'm there answering them every day and um, and everybody can see each other's answers and, and share ideas and that sort of thing. So, so my plan is I have a, a series of online courses uh, for music teachers at the moment which I'm planning on moving inside that, that membership area but it will be also a place where people can connect with one another and share lesson plans and um, share difficulties that they're going through or, mm-hmm. or how they've overcome things that have gone wrong. So, so that's the future plans. And um, I'm trying to think of a name for it at the moment, but yeah, I've, it's the music technology community at the moment in my head. That's my working yeah. title, which <laughs> is really boring. <laughs> mm-hmm. So I might have something snappier to say, but, but yeah, that, that will be the future, which will be great. So I'm hoping in the, you know, sort of January, that's my plan, January is to get that all, all going in together. Great. Yeah. Well, thanks again for spending the time. No problem at all. Good to talk mm-hmm. to you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Make sure you check out what Katie's doing at midnightmusic.com.au. Lots of amazing articles on her blog with new technology, ways of using it in the classroom, and amazing classes. And make sure you check out ClassTrack.org, where we have lots of resources for teachers in music technology and education, as well as implementing things like Ableton Live within the classroom, music production, mixing, you name it. And make sure you subscribe to this YouTube channel. We're going to have more interviews and meeting the different educators within this field, as well as other videos around music technology and music education.